A number of years ago, uh, Stephen Bess, who graduated in, in 1995, uh, called me and said he really appreciated the writing program at MBA. Uh, he was able to, he felt, be very successful at Rice University, where he also was a, a star baseball pitcher and pitched in the Baseball World Series. And he said he, he's used his writing in his job in many different ways, and he wanted to recognize uh, the, the work that the faculty did in, in helping him be a better writer. And so he, he said, can we come up with an idea like the one we're about to, uh, to do in assembly of a college essay writing contest? Uh, and Stephen has generously funded it. Um, so we have three seniors who will read their college essays, and we have a, a panel of, uh, on my right, uh, uh, Mr. Chris Janssen, who is the Vice President uh, of Admissions Enrollment at, at Vanderbilt, uh, Ms. Leanne Backman, who is the Director of Admissions at Rhodes College in Memphis, and Maggie Raines, who, as you all know, is an English teacher here and has worked in college counseling. So we will have them judge the three essays, and we will now ask these three students to come up respectively. First, uh, Wesley Carlton, then Asher Maxwell, then Jacob Wiener. Join me in welcoming these students to the podium. Late on the night, on the set, on the High Lock Hold Up, my first film, I went around collapsing tripods, unplugging lights, loading up the truck, and looking for errant costumes. I held the precious cards that harbored hours of our footage, locking up the farm gate. I reflected on the beautiful chaos that unfolded that evening. The two antagonists, Larson and Sam, had bolted down the stairs with a tracking shot that begot a spontaneous emergence of teamwork. Larson shoved Sam to the back of the Volkswagen, where its driver, Avery, was waiting. He turned over the ignition, and I peered around the camera, planning to cut when he slammed the door. And some instinct kept me rolling. The bug lurched forward, and Avery turned the wheel to display the glorious broadside of the car, leaving me with a placid, empty frame. I felt grateful for this gift, our all-in team effort. This is me living and breathing my craft. One day, my crew had a look of carrying a live bomb. Anson, a key supporting role, told me he was out of time. My film had drawn him too far away from the family. <laughs> Gripping the steady cam, I panicked inside my head. Would we film another actor from behind or write him out altogether? I told Anson to sleep on it and went home to email his parents, laying out the importance of seeing the project through and creating a memory we cherish forever. Awaiting their response, I felt this experience plant the seed of the leader I want to be, reaching for a seemingly impossible goal and making my team believe it could be done. My email was successful, and after a day off, I got Anson back to film his final scenes. I was learning. My earliest memories are filled with creative inspiration. In books I read with my mom, there were kids digging for clams and an old woman who named things. I would put my feet up on the beams in my bunk and stare at the little stars we taped there. Magical illustrations and unforgettable words. I tuned into the West through my mom's love of Native American art and my grandfather named John Wayne. I remember a white knuckle drive up the mining road from Silverton past ghost towns and coal carts. I stayed awake while everyone snored through Once Upon a Time in the West. Afterwards, I reimagined the 10-second shot of Jill staring in the mirror. Heading into the summer and running on the steam of Hilux success, I felt ready for the big one. That spring, I wrote an original screenplay, Axel and Ollie. It covered numerous locations, a river, cabin, Italian cafe, a foot chase through the city. And at last, seven characters flowing through a dozen scenes, but one night, a week before we were set to film, I collapsed on the couch, trying to mend a hopeless schedule. My mom found me and put things in perspective. 
She knew I needed to do something smaller and do it well. The same mom who always nurtured my inspiration believed it was no time to lose my head. In that moment, I stood up and became the leader the project needed. A Stephen Crane story from English class broke through the fog. I remembered its simplicity, the crackling hearth, the snapping cards, and the Swede lost in the West. When we started building the Blue Hotel, I knew I was taking the right steps, learning to walk before I could run. As I looked to my future, I realized that with the right approach, I can build a body of work that inspires people as I have been inspired. My job has always been to hand off that torch of inspiration. So many others have touched it, and I feel their fingerprints. Will they feel mine? Thank you. I walked into the dining hall, wondering how to fill my two-hour lunch. Our camp had begun that morning, and we had just finished hearing a lecture on electoral strategy from a campaign operative. Despite being excited from the lecture, I was nervous going into lunch because I did not know anyone else at the Campaigns and Elections Summer Academy. I decided I would eat slowly so I'd have something to do for two hours. As I sat down, I overheard someone criticize an observation made in the lecture about the presidential candidates. Disagreeing with the criticism, I felt obligated to respond. So I pointed out some reasons I thought they were wrong. A third person chimed in to disagree with me, followed by a fourth to defend my position. Soon, our entire lunch table was vehemently discussing the upcoming presidential election. Our conversation veered into the esoteric. We discussed the outcomes of every congressional, senatorial, and gubernatorial race in the 2018 primary and general elections, and the messages or strategies that were used in each race. We argued over which types of candidates performed better in elections, and which candidates would perform, perform well in the upcoming elections. We fluently recited vote margins, district numbers, and candidate names. To an eavesdropper, our conversation would have sounded like a foreign language. After what I felt like was only a few minutes, the lunch period ended. Looking down at my tray, I realized I had hardly touched my food. I found our conversation so interesting and so nourishing that I had forgotten to eat. For the first time, I was surrounded by people who, like me, had a deep passion for elections. It was a liberating experience. I was finally able to talk to companions about elections for hours without boring them. They asked me questions and challenged me with thoughtful counterpoints, and I did the same with them. The week-long camp that I was initially anxious about became one of the most engaging experiences of my life. To this day, I remain in touch with one of my friends from that camp. We call each other twice a month to discuss the latest candidate announcements, television ads, and election pollings. We always begin our conversations by agreeing to keep the call short, yet they always persist late into the night. The uniqueness of every person's opinions and the malleabilities of those opinions fascinate me. This curiosity is why I love to discuss politics with people. I never just want to argue with them. Rather, I want to hear about their beliefs and learn how their opinions have changed over time. Though I might forget important details, like full names or birthdays, I have an almost perfect catalog of the political beliefs of my family, friends, and acquaintances. My work on several campaigns has led me to interact with hundreds of voters, either on their doorstop, doorsteps, at campaign events, or over the phone. Talking with these voters has only hardened my love of campaign work. Sometimes I will catch myself asking questions about their views, not in order to, to persuade them, but out of genuine curiosity. I can still remember the faces and stories behind almost all of the conversations I've had. Most doors I knock on go unanswered or are met with apathetic or even hostile responses. But once every so often, I meet someone who is friendly and willing to talk about political issues. Our conversations feed my interest in elections and passion for campaign work. By following the granular details of elections, both in the United States and across the world, I want to learn why and how arguments are lost, or won and lost in the public arena. I am interested, interested in voter persuasion, not just for the sake of winning elections and arguments, but also so I can learn from everyone's opinions in order to refine my own.
As I walked into French class, I did not notice that the chalkboard, usually filled with doodles or instructions, was devoid of writing. When my last classmate sat down, the mood in the room jumped instantly from relaxed to serious. My teacher stood up from his desk and marched to the hanging projector screen. As he released the screen, it spun back up into its compartment over the chalkboard and unveiled a single written question. C'est quoi le bonheur? Such an unexpected and wildly existential question left me dumbfounded. I knit my eyebrows together and squinted my eyes and thought, what is happiness? I figured that happiness must manifest itself as a tangible thing, like the people with whom you surround yourself or the activities you enjoy. My mind conjured the feeling of excitement and untapped potential of a new set of oil pastels or the smell of new shoe leather ready for a custom painted design. Feeling the excitement, I believed that these items must be the tactile happiness I sought. As I contemplated my happiness through physical pursuits, the idea of true happiness drifted further away. Was happiness just a feeling of pleasure from being social or satisfaction after a good meal? It had to be something beyond such simple everyday occurrences. After all, I thought, there must be a difference between the feeling of contentment and true euphoria. Pleasure and satisfaction are certainly good emotions, but to substitute them with the term happiness is to downplay its true meaning. Searching for my own moments of happiness, I reflected upon times when I felt elated. I found that these moments of euphoria never related to satisfaction toward a physical item, but instead a feeling of freedom and detachment from worldly possessions. I pondered the happiness I experienced when I went cliff jumping in Michigan and was suspended in the air, leaving everything that weighed me down back at my launching point. I recalled when I hiked on Isle Royale in Lake Superior and absorbed the stunning view of the lake. During these moments, I didn't feel simple excitement when jumping from the waterfall, or soul contentment from the outlook onto the lake. I felt separated from myself, as if my mind was beyond my body. I realized that happiness is more than a flash of joy. It is a mindset in which the self is removed from the body and connected with a greater flow in the universe. Instead of a closer attachment, to, to materialistic things, a disengagement from those tangible elements brings true happiness. At that moment, I was far from my French class. My mind merged from the cave of tangibility, unleashing my conception of emotion beyond our worldly realm. True happiness is not getting a new box of oil pastels, but creating with them. The flow of the colorful stick over the paper lets my unbound mind explore. The vibrant hue of each blue, red, and yellow throws me into a new reality of color. The gritty texture leaves behind a story in each mark. Expressing my ideas on the paper, I feel removed from reality, yet more connected to the greater universe. Whether drawing a hyper-realistic pencil portrait or creating an abstract and wildly colorful pastel. Losing myself in my universe of color, shape, line, texture, and value. I find genuine happiness through art. During most of my life, I have believed that contentment equaled happiness. Only after contemplating these words, c'est quoi le bonheur, did I rise above my own ego and materialistic ideals. Pure happiness is always within me, as long as I can express my creativity. Walking out of French class, I wondered what other questions I have yet to explore. Thank you. Hello. I'd like to start by thanking um, our participants, Wesley, Asher, and Jacob, for getting up and sharing their thoughts or their essays with you all. I think what you have seen, and for all of you who have been here over the years, the college essay is a really important part of the application process. You all right now are exploring your interests and you're figuring out what it is that you find interesting and appealing. Colleges and universities want to know about that. In a test optional environment, essays and recommendations have become even more important. So it's really important that you all think about who you are and what is important. 
from the essays, colleges and universities don't want to have a litany of what you are, have already done. They want to learn the why. Why are you interested in something? What have you gained from that experience? And how has that experience changed your perspective? So the essays that you heard today shared a lot of that. They shared their experiences, but it wasn't just a, here's what I've done. It's a, here's what I've thought about. Here's what I've learned. Here is my perspective. So thank you for sharing those, that information today. I also want to echo Mr. Joya's th uh, thanks to our judges, um, my friends and, and colleagues, uh, Doug, Leanne, and Ms. Rains, um, for being here. The reality of what we do in college admissions um, is really to make certain that we are, as a school, a high school, conveying information to our colleagues on the other side of the desk. Um, and it's really nice to have a working relationship where they come and they can help us to help you learn a little bit more about the process. So without further ado, if you all want to do that, the winner of this year's contest is Asher Maxwell.